6.47 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, March 9th, 2022 years from something. I want to start out by thanking everyone for everyone who participated in the comments of the last two videos I made, which, you know, really weren't, you know, normal topic, but it was simply just an illustration of something that's happening. And, um, yeah. An, an experiment sort of which I th it was an experiment but there was you know more there the thing that's interesting about it is I you know I have um, various videos um, that are exposés of radio frequencies and how a number of companies uh, countries out there actually have like they have much stricter laws on what cell phone companies can can do what they will allow in cell phone sales as far as to you know targeting children young people that are far more prone to this radiation than adults um and Funny enough, all of the countries that actually do have pretty strict or far stricter regulations on all that technology are countries that have about the lowest per capita rate of Israelites, Germanics, Celts in them. Check it out. But here's the thing. Um, over and over... In the videos that I have, when they're talking about cell phone safety, they say over and over again that, you know, the only really safe way uh, to keep your cell phone is, is on airplane mode. Or sometimes they'll say off. Um, I think some of them actually said, you know, if you want to keep it near your person, have it on airplane mode or off. Well, and that's the thing. That's... I don't know why so many of them think that that's actually safe, which is why I made those videos showing you that even when it's off, it's not safe. You're still getting, um, you're still getting pulses, radio frequency pulses, uh, in or from your cell phone that are in excess. They're in excess of 18 to 20 times what the normal amount is for a radio quiet environment and I would have to assume the pulse is being that high and with with what work's been done very limited work by the way because you can't get funded the commission is all made up of of people who are part of the industry or dirty politicians and I don't know why I put dirty in there because it seems uh, redundant but the few independent researchers that are have looked into this, for the most part, if they seem like they're uh, sincere, with one voice, pretty much, will tell you that those pulses are more dangerously and more carcinogenic on biological life than the what you would read at the bottom of a meter which would be sort of the, the constancy of the, the radio frequency. It's the pulses, those huge, gigantic pulses. And you see, I, I have a very good understanding of it just on a personal level, because <clears throat> for some time now, probably before the chemo even started, during the cancer, a lot of this might have to do with how saturated my environment has been with radio frequencies for seven, eight years. Probably more, actually. If, if we consider the first time I got Wi-Fi in my apartment um, when I was a bachelor. Long time. And I have had symptoms, neurological symptoms, that have been building over that time. Not knowing what they were, of course, at all. Um, but now, after all this time, and because of the 
intensity of the symptoms and what they do I've determined that it is it is mostly related to my vagus nerve now there's a port that I still have in from the chemo it's got to come out I had to jump through all kinds of hoops to make that happen because once an appliance or something goes in <clears throat> The doctor's not necessarily obligated to take it out. Not necessarily. Not if they say, well, we still think it would it's going to be necessary, so we don't like that idea. Okay, once you accept it, you accept it. And you're going to have to do some ass kissing sometimes to get these things out of your fucking body. And I say that with frustration because it is frustrating. It's frustrating how much power medicine has and how completely full of shit these people are they're full of shit none of these people that I've been to or talked to I've been to a number of doctors um, let's just say in the last six months or so since I moved up to Michigan new healthcare system and all of that and I have to seek trying to get this poured out of me since I'm done with the chemo and everything um, these people know nothing about your nervous system nothing I mean literally across the board these people all sort of buy into that Freudian um, what would you call it, it, it <clears throat> doctors were recording these problems and calling it neurasthenia um, or actually what it was it um, you well yeah um, something like that is it neurasthenia or is that just a who album concept album? something very similar to that and I don't sorry I don't have it in front of me but they knew about it that's what they were recording it as and they were seeing the correlation between certain technologies the telegraph lines and the electrical lines and so on and so forth and these cases and then you know Freud comes along and says it's it's more mental and emotional and you know and then they spent a long time saying, well, we can fix it with basically we're, we're going to design petrochemical medications that essentially work to sort of deaden those things so that you can't notice that there's something really wrong. Same thing with painkillers, right? <clears throat> if you smashed your finger and you had enough painkillers, you might not even care that your finger smashed. You might you might not even set it so that it'll heal right same kind of thing with your nervous system and all of these petrochemical drugs that they design but yeah thanks thanks everyone for participating in that I did get some good advice there were good comments so I do appreciate them whenever you can interact and you've got good stuff to say and and especially in those videos because there's I'm sure there's so many people out there that have uh, you know a, a pretty decent understanding of these things um, maybe more than a lot of the other topics I, I touch on so I always appreciate that anyways so today this is not this is not going to be about that um, Today is is nothing but a shameless shuckle grab. Um, it's going to be about tartary. All for the shuckles. Now, this is going to be... It's not really. Because it's this whole narrative is so important to what I do. Historically, geographically, biblically. It, As far as I'm concerned, this is how I see it. I see it as the direct answer to, and not only the direct answer to, but the um, getting in front of it, controlling the narrative. And it's amazing that they are able to do this with a lot of very big, important issues. They get in front of it. It's like, you know, they use their, their algorithms to just map ideas out and they see what seems to be gaining traction or what's out there or what they determine 
could be a real serious problem and they get in front of it and they control the narrative way ahead of schedule so that by the time somebody gets some real traction like I'm starting to gain with um, geography and history as it ties into the Bible and the importance of America and the real story as the best evidence seems to present itself they're already saturated they've saturated everything on YouTube Facebook any other platform with this idea of Tartaria see that architecture and how ubiquitous it is it's not a damic it's Tartarian where everybody lived in a multi culty paradise and enjoyed free energy and um, it was so wonderful until I literally I've put up a meme at my Obery project project panoply Facebook site it was just a copy paste meme that somebody else had put up that there was this paradise on earth where there's so much brotherly love and goodness and free energy and free blowjobs and the Germans came along and just destroyed it all they literally blame the Germans yep so that ought to be another clue right there as to the nature of even calling this whole thing Tartarian is that you know is that wonderful brilliant Adamic architecture that we could do again if the knowledge of how to and the techniques and all of that haven't been robbed from us and are being kept secret well yes we could it's specifically Adamic it's not necessarily Tartarian and what's more bizarre than that <clears throat> is they keep calling it Tartarian 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 but the thing is almost all of the examples that they have of this great infrastructure old buildings uh architecture world's fairs so on and so forth so on and so forth so on and so forth where are they where are they north america europe predominantly and yes there are structures that we can look at and study that are in various places around the world but very little with the sort of concentration and mystery and the sort of infrastructure that America has with such unreal, unbelievable claims of how quickly all of this infrastructure was built, came about. So with as much as they call things Tartarian, 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 it's pretty crazy to me how many of these Tartarian people spend most of their time in America. North America. Pretty weird. Since I've been saying for years that the real center of the old world was North America. Okay, what I want to do, uh, I want to cover not this article, but an article that he linked. It. This was, this is a um, article thread uh, at stolenhistory.net by the administrator of the site who goes by Dreamtime. From what I know, Dreamtime uh, is German. And let's see. But what he has here, okay, this thread is actually entitled Tartaria is a myth and didn't exist. Now, this is from somebody who's a very serious alternative history researcher. Okay. He administrates this site, StolenHistory.net, which this site is pretty loaded with some very good resources, including the booklet version of bringing it all together in the library, because he okayed that. So good on him. I appreciate that. Because it is pertinent. It's not the status quo today, but neither is this article. Now, what he did when he started out this article is he does link right away. He says, read this to get an overview of previous research on Tartaria. And this is the Stolen History Archive, tar um, Tartary, an empire hidden in history. It was bigger than Russia once. We're going to start out by looking at that. And, and this may not actually get covered in this video, but it's 
This topic is super important. It's intrinsic to all of the other work that I do, no matter if it's language, um, geography, history, um, ethnologically. It's so important because, in my opinion, this is the opposition. The whole idea and the whole fact that it now overshadows every good I would say more weighty, pertinent point that we should be looking at and dealing with. It overshadows so much of that. And I think a number of presuppositions and intentionally inserted ideas and buzzwords and terms and all of that have, have really muddied the waters badly, really badly. So that's why I'm going to take a look at it. If it takes a few of the briefs to cover it, so be it. All right, so I took a break and I'm back. I opened up Google Maps because I want to compare something on Google Maps. And of course, Google Maps is going to start you out from <clears throat> your location. And I'm in Michigan. And I do have to comment on something. This is some real talk because it's... I've never experienced such a thing in my life. I went to the UP <clears throat> for the first time ever a few months back in the fall. I guess a lot of people migrate there in the fall for the, the leaves changing, and I get why now that I've been there. <clears throat> I stayed about center, right, right in about the center of the UP right there, you know. And we traveled kind of all over more of the eastern part of the UP. Went up to Whitefish Bay and um, hit the uh, the springs, Kitchitakippi and uh, falls and all that stuff. And it was fine. And I've been I've been to other places, really neat places. You know, when I I lived in Indiana and when I was a kid, you know, we went to Tippecanoe, we, which was cool. Um, I've been out west to a number of places. I've seen the Badlands and the Black Hills. Um, I've seen a lot of things. I'm not inexperienced. And I'm going to tell you something. I didn't see that much. A few things, and they were neat. Especially the springs were just amazing. I have pictures. They're, it's really something. I've never in my life, ever, felt such a real, strong pull to be somewhere like the pull I feel from what they call the UP. I don't know what it is, but I'm telling you, it's, for me anyways, and I've heard others actually say pretty similar things there's something about it I don't know what it is I don't know if it's that so much of it is uncivilized un unindustrialized it's very backwoods and I've been to a lot of places that are like that too that I've never been like ah, I gotta get back there and they were beautiful they really were and there's something to be said about that you know, just that lack of industry and, and, and all of that and a purity. But I don't know. Something to that. Something to that UP. So I'm going to get back there soon. And I'm going to go up to uh, the Keweenaw Peninsula and check that out because of the history there. So now the first thing I want to point out <clears throat> is, well, not on this one, the Wikipedia. That's actually, we're going to probably look at that this old map and this is what from the Encyclopedia Britannica so this isn't an Ortilius or anything okay <clears throat> the map of Grand Tartary and you'll see this a lot the Grand Tartary area is in this sort of teal color and what they might call lesser Tartary is maybe just parts of Europe 
Uh, I think some people claim that all of Europe, um, if they do, uh, there's a reason to that, which I cover a bit, of course, in bringing it all together. I really tried to cover as much of everything in that presentation that I could, that I had the brain power to cover, <clears throat> that I had the resources to cover, that I had the time to edit video <laughs> to cover. But this is supposed to be the main, you know, the Grand Tartary, this this area here that we see in this in this teal. So I'm going to go to Google Maps. We, we can see that actually it... Now, here's something, though. In a lot of other maps that you'll find that has this Grand Tartary, even these areas that spread out <clears throat> up and over and to the west of the Caspian Sea, oftentimes they're not part of what's called Grand, Grand Tartary on certain old maps. In fact, I think this map is actually maybe a little more generous than a lot of other older maps that I've seen that don't really have this part over here to the west in there. Okay, it's mostly here. So just as a comparison on Google Maps, what would this look like? <clears throat> All right, well, you got to figure some things when we look at this. The, the highest concentration of civilization, and now you have to consider this, civilization in the sense of civilized people who are advanced to a degree who have developed trading networks shipping, trading. Um, if there's things you're in need of, and you have things others are in need of, trade can be very beneficial, for one thing. For another thing, let's just forget about trade. Let's just say that you're part of a civilization that really doesn't want to um, trade all that much. You've got what you need. You don't need things from the outside and um, so forth. You still need, for you to have a good, high civilization, you still need certain things. You need uh, access to good soil and enough of it, good arable land. <clears throat> you need access to uh, good water supplies. You need to have a certain amount of shelter from the elements. So, you know, if you pick a place that just gets so buried um, by the winter every year and, and you you know, it's going to limit how much you can grow and develop if you can't at least tame that. And we do see um, certain civilizations. When I say civilizations, all I have to mean is literally like maybe a big city that has the signs of high culture. Okay? That's all I mean by that. It doesn't have to be a country or anything. But that's what we would look for. You have to have certain things present. The, the water, if you're going to be traveling, shipping, or anything like that, harbor, um, ways to get out to the sea, uh, whether you have to do it by road, by rail, or whatever else, you know, usually a big river, and, and oftentimes a big river that comes far inland is going to give you one of the best safe harbors that you can have, you know, which is why we see, for instance, London, this gigantic city that's miles in on the Thames and cities on the east coast of the United States that are miles in on big rivers that you can sail really huge ships up for a long ways. That gives you a very, very good harbor. These are important. Rivers are important for life. And oftentimes, the bigger the river, of course, the, the better it's going to be for if you want to trade and do other things, travel because rivers and seas are just natural highways. So what we should see, since man has been around for some time, we should be seeing, if there was a great empire here, signs of a number of cities that now don't exist. And I, I wouldn't know why they, they wouldn't. We would have to get into the realm of speculation about things like desertification, 
climate change and things like that. But in general, this whole area, which on Google Maps, it would be this basic area here. So uh, including Mongolia and parts of China, essentially all of the green area around um, Korea and China and all of that, those are the basically the places that are most suitable for civilization. And that's where most of the people are concentrated is all along the coast here. All right. Same thing in here. You've got a lot of denseness, but it's, it's heavily jungle. It's very tropical, um, which can oftentimes be pretty difficult to tame. Then we have India, which because of certain factors of where India is at and everything, it has some of the highest potentials for certain types of cash crops. It's a very good, and also India is far bigger than this in contrast to what they're making out, you know, because these maps are distorted. <clears throat> but even though you have all of this, this green up here, and you have just tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of land up here, right? It's not all that livable except in small pockets and we don't have great major cities. So when everybody starts pointing at everything that they find in North America, sometimes in Central America, if we have to keep calling this Central America, South America, um, and then from basically Panama up North America, and then in uh, Europe, they keep calling it Tartarian. Well, the thing is, I don't know of any infrastructure that's really in what is traditionally been called Tartaria. I mean, of course, we have it in areas of Russia that are either along the coast up top here in the north, or mostly what's mainland Europe. Throughout here, most of, of Russia's civilization would be more considered in, in mainland Europe. So what I'm saying is the vast majority of the area that we are told was Grand Tartary is a wasteland with little to no signs of civilization. We have accounts like we might get to where people say they stumbled on certain places, but it's an account and I haven't actually seen the proof of that. You know, I watched a um, I watched a movie called I think it was called The Way Back about these uh, prisoners in a Russian gulag, and they were in a gulag that was north of this lake B B um, Baikal, and they traveled from this gulag north of Baikal down to Baikal, and then through Mongolia, um, through the um, the Gobi Desert all the way down to the Himalayas, through the Himalayas, and to India. And I'll tell you, if I had to describe everything they saw and experienced in that travel, and so mostly they traveled through a good deal of what we would consider as a Grand Tartary. If I had to describe it all in one word, it would be bleak or deadly. These are wildernesses. And I don't even know really, <clears throat> again, all of these maps, strangely enough, this whole area up here is always distorted. There's always so much mystery, for us anyways, what all is up here. And I'll tell you something else. I personally am unconvinced that if you put these two continents together, like say that you would see like on a Gleason's map, that they aren't far more together with just small areas of bays, seas, rivers, and like you can see in, in Upper Canada, it's just pockmarked with all kinds of, of lakes and, and just really spongy, odd-looking land, that that's precisely what you're going to find up here 
with just various waterways and such between the two, and then boom, you're in Canada or Greenland. I, I literally think that they're probably that close together. And that the worst thing about the travel between the two is seasonally. Which, if you track back the sun a few centuries, the travel would have probably been easier. Um, and maybe even more centuries, much easier. And I don't think there's any way to absolutely prove, to absolutely prove, that these two land masses aren't nestled nearly right up against one another. Why? Because I believe the assumption that the North Pole um, is whatever you want to assume it is, whether from the uh, Mercator North Pole maps, the way that he, he likes to, to put that land mass uh, in the middle, um, or whether you think it's uh, like, like modern establishment maps with a whole lot of ice cap in the middle, however you want to imagine it. There's no way that I'm aware of to prove that there has to be a certain amount of distance based on the lines of latitude and degrees, what they've called these degrees and lines of latitude, that they absolutely have to exist as they say. And what I mean essentially is, you know, if we get to an area that's, you know, 30 north latitude or something, that there's no way to absolutely prove that that is indeed 30 north latitude as opposed to being 5 north latitude. Do you see where I'm going with that? So when we see a lot of maps, which we're going to see on, on this page, that shows this correlation between um, Upper Eastern Asia, like on, on this one, I think I have this map, and I don't know, again, who the cartographer is, where you see North America all in yellow and this area that we would call uh, Grand Tartary all in yellow, that there isn't a really good reason for it, and that is because they're literally not necessarily adjoining adjoining, but pretty darn close. Which is another one of the reasons why I say when, for instance, a direction like uh, in the Bible, Tzpun, is used. It literally just means a direction, like not as, as far as magnetics or anything else, but just that way, that way, like we think of north, that way. And if you follow it that way, you end up in northern Europe and northeastern Asia. Which, according, of course, to other old maps, this whole area was considered Inde, not Tartaria. Okay, whether there was a real shift or whether that was literally just a term is one of the big questions to be answered. So let's see. A couple of things that are brought up here. It starts with this map and a quote, Tartary, a vast country in the northern parts of Asia, bounded by Siberia on the north and west, bounded by, including. This is called Great Tartary. The Tartars who lie south of Muscovy and Siberia are those of Astrakhan, Circassia, and Dagestan. Situated northwest of the Caspian Sea, the Kalmuk Tartars, who lie between Siberia and the Caspian Sea, Uzbek Tartars, and Mughals, who lie north of Persia and India, and lastly, those of Tibet, who lie northwest of China. Encyclopedia Britannica, Volume 3, Edinburgh, 1771, page 887. Well, interesting enough, though, Bernier put the concentration of the Mughals in India. And that was said to be written long before this. Okay. That's just one thing. Anyways, um, now compare to the description given by Wikipedia. Tartary, Latin Tartaria, or Great Tartary, Latin Tartaria Magna, 
was a name used from the Middle Ages until the 20th century to designate the great tract of northern and central Asia stretching from the Caspian Sea and the Ural Mountains to the Pacific Ocean, settled mostly by Turco-Mongol peoples after the Mongol invasion and the subsequent Turkish uh, migration, or Turkic, uh, I'm sorry. 1701, a system of geography, the country of Tartary, called Great Tartary to distinguish it, it from the lesser in Europe. There's that lesser Tartary. For it has its boundaries on the west, the Caspian Sea, the Moscovitic Tartary on the north, the Scythian or Tartarian Sea on the east, the Sea of the Kamek... Is it Cal? It might be Kalmekites and the Strait of Jeffo on the south, China, India, or the dominions of the Great Mogul and Persia, so that it is apparently the largest region of the whole continent of Asia, extending itself farthest both towards the north and in the east. In modern maps, it is placed within the 70th and 170th degree of longitude, excluding um, Muscovitic Tartary, as also between the 40th and 72 degree of northern latitude. So what's interesting about that is this. So if you have that many different sort of cultures in there and you have a Tartary in each one of those cultures, what I would liken it to is this. All right. Um, apparently, some time ago, the mountains that actually span uh, sort of like a spine on North and South America. Now in North America, they're known as the Rockies. And then as they descend towards South America, then they become known as the Andes. But a long time ago, they used to just be called the Mountains Cordillere or Cordillere. So what you would have, if you were talking about the Mountains Cordillere, you could have the uh, Peruvian Cordillere. You could have the Brazilian Cordillera. You could have the Guatemalan Cordillera, Mexican Cordillera. You could have the American Cordillera, or you could have the individual states Cordillera. And then you would get up into the Canadian Cordillera. Do you, do you see what I'm, where I'm going with that? If we're talking about essentially sort of a geographical feature or something that spans a long distance, the Sahara Desert in Africa, okay? Egyptian Sierra, Libyan Sierra, um, Sahara, sorry, not Sierra. But you see what I mean. All the way over Moroccan Sahara. It's a feature. And it spans through a number of cultures and hits certain areas of a number of cultures. And I would say the reason that it hits so many areas of so many different cultures is because it is a vast, certainly a varying sort of wilderness, but a very vast wilderness that not as much can be done with because of its lack of, first off, serious exit waterways, and probably the expense to put in a lot of infrastructure through there, and cities within all of that, because as we found with the, uh, the civilizing of Palestine in the last century, just that tiny little country to make it look like it was really blooming took such massive amounts of money put into it for water filtration and water moving systems that the, the sheer amounts have not yet been told. It's so much. So I would say the reason that we wouldn't find many, though we might, because if you're, if you're crossing these huge tracts of land, let's say by rail, it would be good to have um, 
cities in between or stops in between or something in between um, even if you have a road you would need those things but the thing is they're they're either gonna have to be close to a, a, a good fresh water source and food source arable land or something or you're going to have to constantly be supplying them with that like with the so-called Jerusalem and Palestine it has to be supplied with fresh water or it, it could not sustain the sort of populations it has it could not possibly the one in Palestine could not possibly hope to sustain the sort of populations that the Bible describes not a chance so let's see now there's this idea of a CIA leak and I guess you can make what you want of it and I, of course this video is probably all going to be taken up really with the background to all of this before we actually get into uh, the main article which linked on to this so it says and to add some credibility or take away some I like that to the story below you can find an excerpt from the CIA document declassified in 1998 and created in 1957 and it says reads or let us take the matter of history which along with religion language and literature constitute the core of a people's cultural heritage yes it does here again the communists have interfered in a shameless manner and we all know that the CIA was working with the communists during the whole extent of the Cold War it's so that's why it's so dubious and that's why I'm glad they said or to take away some credibility they go on for example on 9th of August 1944 the Central Committee of the Communist Party sitting in Moscow issued a directive ordering the party's Tartar Provincial Committee to proceed to a scientific revision of the history of Tartaria to liquidate serious shortcomings and mistakes of a nationalistic character committed by individual writers and historians in dealing with Tartar history. In other words, Tartar history was to be rewritten, let us be frank, was to be falsified in order to eliminate references to great Russian aggressions and to hide the facts of the real course of Tartar-Russian relations, and this was no isolated case. In every Muslim area within the USSR, historians on orders of the Communist Party have rewritten history to distort the facts, and that the Russians appear always in a good light. Needless to say, histories which present the facts truthfully have been withdrawn and destroyed so that the present and future generations of Muslims are forever denied the chance of learning the true facts of their nation's past. And I don't think they should be denied learning the true facts of their nation's past. They should not be denied, for one thing, Bernier's information uh, in his book, The, uh, the Late History of the Grand Mogul, um, or The Late Revolution. Anyways, Bernier... They shouldn't be denied what Bernier has to say about Muslims, that Muslims originally were, again, white, just like the original Mughals. They shouldn't be denied that. They shouldn't be denied any of their history. But I don't believe a word that the CIA is, is claiming to declassify uh, without any redaction um, that's critical of the USSR. Uh, during the Cold War, because the Cold War was a complete front-to-back, top-to-bottom sham. So, we'll go on. Now, this is the interesting one that I would say, I, I would like to see what the uh, proof on the ground is. I like proof on the ground. I like to examine it, and consider it. Um, I don't like up-close myopic proof on the ground like I've seen with a lot of people who try to prove that certain things were mud flood by getting up way too close and not pulling back and considering the landscape and possible reasons why buildings might be showing certain signs of what seems to be, appears to be mud flood. But anyways, this one is, this uh, little section is entitled Tartarian Cities. It says, on the third day, this is um, from a source, I believe it's called Huck's Travels in Tartary. Now, what I'd like to know 
and it's right here. What I'd like to know is whether or not this was published by the Hakloit Society or not, because that would be very important, either the Hakloit Society or the Royal Society. Anyone having to do with the Royal Society or the Royal Geographic Society, that's a big red flag. It says, on the third day, we came in the solitude upon an imposing majestic monument of antiquity, a large city utterly abandoned. Such remains of ancient cities are of no unfrequent occurrence in the deserts of Mongolia, but everything connected with their origin and history is buried in darkness. Oh, with what sadness does such a spectacle fill the soul? The ruins of Greece, the superb remains of Egypt, all these, it is true, tell of death all belong to the past yet when you gaze upon them you know what they are you can retrace in memory the revolutions which have occasioned the ruins and the decay of the country around them descend um, descend into the tomb wherein was buried alive the city of herculaneum you find there it is true a gigantic skeleton but you have within you historical associations wherewith to galvanize it and then here is underlined by the poster, but of these old abandoned cities of Tartary, not a tradition remains. They are tombs without an epitaph. And then he went on to uh, underline just below that, <clears throat> um, Monsieur or Mr. Huck mentions that he found a Mongol shepherd among the ruins who knew no more of the place than that it was called uh, the old town in quotes now are there examples of what would appear to be ancient um, spectacular cities that are currently uninhabited because I made some illusion like we would expect, maybe I should finish it, a place that is good to inhabit, that is productive to inhabit. In the past, we should typically find it inhabited today. I think that holds true. Now, some people could say, well, what about the sites, for instance, what about the sites, for instance, in Mexico? or South America, or other sites where there's all of these ruins of a great city. Well, the funny thing is, most of the time, those ruins are right near a city. Still places where civilization are. And here's the thing is, I don't believe that those cities that most of, like, the the old ruins in Mexico, or ones in India or lower uh, Asia, we'll say like uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, Air, that peninsula. I don't think any of those places are inhabited by the same people that first built and inhabited those cities which are now in ruins. And I would speculate that on close examination, we might find either that a river had been diverted, floodplains possibly changed, or that there were various water systems once used and there was a reason that that old city was in a different location than the new city. I would further speculate that those living in most of the newer cities, which tend to adjoin or are very close to those ancient cities and ruins, that most of the people who inhabit them are simpler people who tend to need to be right at the source of certain things because that's how they live and that's how they use resources. They don't live and use resources in the same way as the people who built all of those. And if you watch Bringing It All Together, you, you'll know exactly who I believe, based on a mountain of evidence, were the actual builders of all of these places. And I believe all of them were built location-specific in the first place. 
So we'll move forward. Now, of course, I get into this in bringing it all together. The propaganda about what we're told the cons look like or Timurlane these days, Oriental, 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 right? But you start going back in time, and boy, isn't it funny? They is white folks. Yeah, these really old pictures of Timurlane, the, the moguls, uh, the cons. Here's Timurlane right here. What? They is what? They is white as a sheep. Shocking. And of course, I'm sure the people that don't think too deep into this would say that's more propaganda that's lies to keep up us people down when they're not spending any real time looking at um, ethnology cultures what cultures are able to gain under what uh, situations some people might look at how powerful and big and technological India and China are and they'll completely ignore the fact that all of the technology, techniques, and wealth from the West, Europe, and most specifically North America, has been stolen or, and or transferred over there to build up those places to make them look like empires. What am I saying? Am I saying the Orientals and Indians aren't smart and other non-whites aren't smart? No, I'm not saying that. They're not the same. The way they think isn't the same. Um, their creative prowess isn't the same. And I know this because I was, I, I was a race mixer for years with a Japanese. And I think the Japanese are in general very intelligent. I think the Japanese are some of the most, um, think of the right term for it. Um, as far as their intelligence and their spirituality and other things, they are among the most advanced non-whites I've, I've ever known and interacted with. There's always outliers, but in general. And the thing is, one thing I, I brought away from all of that, other than the fact that our flesh is quite different, and I think that should be obvious. It was obvious to me, but I mean, I was taught that I mean, it was just good for me to race mix. The other thing I took away from it is they are vastly different than us. In ways that are much more difficult, unless you spend enough time around these people to put your finger on the way that they think the way they perceive things, the way they approach life, their abilities to make art, to conceive, vastly different and vastly inferior to ours. They can be taught and they can, they can repeat what they're taught. And oftentimes very well. But you have to understand something. If you have a doctor who is not of your, not just race, tribe, and it's been nearly impossible for me to find a doctor of my tribe. I'm from two tribes, Germanic and Celtic. And it's been nearly impossible for me to find a doctor. That's either or both, one of those tribes. The thing you have to realize, they're not even going to approach something like treating you, your health care, the same way. They're so manipulable, in general, they are. The people who now dominate the countries of East Asia and other countries, non-white people, they're far easier to get them to believe um, an official narrative, um, to get them to fall in line with certain things like, hey, this is, we're going to start uh, mandating masking and other types of medical procedures 
and norms and so on and so forth, and they will fall right in line and they'll stay right in line. Excuse me. And oftentimes not question it. So sorry. <clears throat> They're different. All that being said, I'm not saying they're different like in a in a derogatory way. I'm not saying that in a derogatory way because that doesn't have to be derogatory. Okay? Now, coming along and ignoring everything that you can you can provably observe, testify to the difference between peoples. To ignore that, and in the face of everything logical, to keep insisting we was kings, and you stole this and that and the other, and you never had none without us, and we invented peanut butter. That's demeaning. That's what's demeaning. Not what I'm saying. Because I have no, I have no want to take advantage of any of these people. I have no want to use them. I have a want to understand my own past, who I am, who my people are, who everyone is, the nature of this place, and simply to do the best for my loved ones and my tribe and do the best I can before God as I understand him, which is not very good right now, and I'm really trying to do better at that. The problem is, when you turn those tables, I have found consistently that these other people, non-whites, do not share the same sentiments concerning what they're willing to do, because they have willingly taken advantage of us in, in nearly every opportunity they've been given by our enemies, they have taken advantage of us. They don't think the same. They don't act the same. They don't have the same moral center. I'm not saying they don't have any, and I'm not saying they're never... Um, how should I say? Beneficent? <sighs> it might be a good word. I'm not saying that. But I am saying in general, far different. And I believe that shows clearly culturally, and that's one of the ways we can know the difference of who was there, who did what, who wasn't, who didn't. And I'm going to wrap this up before it hits an hour. I'm going to do the next one. I'm going to pick up on this, and then I want to get to Dreamtime's main article. That's still, I, yeah, it's still on the front page uh, topics uh, at StolenHistory.net. I'll put a link in the description to uh, their website. I think it's a very good website for anybody who's interested. Go there, sign up, become a member. It's easy. And it's maintained really well. I really have to believe this guy is German because of how, um, how well he maintains it. It's very orderly. Um, it, you know, anything you, you do, reactions that you get and all of that, I mean, you're, you're constantly being updated on things. It's run very well. It's run very well. Um, so that's all I got today. And uh, I'll see you guys soon. Take care.